Good afternoon, everyone. I guess I'm going to get us started real quick. Um, thank you for coming to our Lunch and Learn. I really want to give a quick shout out. Well, I guess there's some people that aren't part of the council staff here, so I'll let you know who I am. I'm Vizaskia Crockrell. I am the Director of Equity and Social Justice for the council, and very happy to be here. I want to give a huge shout out to the team that put this together that really got the food. Um, we had a little issue earlier, and Renita, where's Renita? Had to run out and get food that you are enjoying today, so when you see her, just thank her. Let's just clap and then we'll tell her. Woo! Also, um, our chair, Tanya, where's she at? She's, you see, they work hard. For them. Uh, she is just fierce in her events and training committee. Uh, they really work hard sending out announcements, developing the flyers to make all of our lunch and learns happen. And we threw this one in as a special lunch and learn. And so just Tanya is just fierce as the chair of our legislative equity and social justice committee. So let's do another clap because she's somewhere. <laughs> woo! You can woo! Woo! All right. All right, <laughs> and finally, the other person that just works vigorously to support the, the committee and also supports me, Carmilla Ennis, works very hard. So I want to thank her, too, and she's nowhere around. <laughs> Honestly, events like this happen because of hardworking, dedicated people to want to raise awareness around equity and social justice issues. So I really appreciate them. Um, and I always have to do this. Uh, thank my fearless leader, Carolyn Bush, who's the chief of staff, who's always supporting me and everyone else here. So thank you, Carolyn. Continue to work hard. Oh, girl. <laughs> she has a rock star necklace on today, if you want to look at that. I told her. When you're done with it, uh -huh. Uh -huh. it really would have looked good with this outfit. Did you guys see my dress today? <laughs> I dressed for you. Okay. With that said, I'm going to finish up and I'm going to turn it over to um, Christina Logsdon. She is the chief of staff for District 1, Chairman Dabowski. Uh, she and I went to an event about two months ago. Uh, that it was a summit on budget and policy, and we were so inspired by how they talked about the history of policy and the impact that it has had on communities of color in the state, and really talked about our tax structure. And so we were inspired, came back, and I told Carolyn, uh, uh, we need to do something, and Christina just jumped on it and contacted them, and it's happening today. So I'm gonna turn it over to Christina. Thank you for all that you've done too. So. Let's give her, I'm a cheerleader by heart. Yeah, woo, bring it on, sister. Okay. Well, I have to say I love how small the world is because April and I know each other from way back and working in, uh, uh, on the, in the state legislature and getting the state to be a better partner on racial equity issues. Um, so you've really made it really easy for us to set this up, so thanks so much. Um, so my name is Christina, for those of you who don't know, and I'm the Chief of Staff for King County Council Chair Rod Dombowski. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing our speakers for today. Um, the first speaker, I, I'm not sure how you all will line this up, but um, the first speaker that I'm going to introduce is Andy Nicholas, who's a senior fellow at the Washington Budget and Policy Center. Um, Andy specializes in state budget and tax policy, and since joining the Budget and Policy Center in 2000, 2009, he has served on a legislative task force on tax preference reform and has conducted numerous analyses on the Washington State Tax Code. Um, Andy has previously worked at the Washington, D.C. based Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, where he performed extensive research on state fiscal policy. He's an expert. Um, additionally, Andy taught English in China, and he holds a Master of, a master of Public Policy from American University's School of Public Affairs. 
Um, we are also joined by some other amazing experts. Um, Juan Jose Bocanegra is the director of All In for Washington. It's a statewide effort to clean up the tax code so all communities in Washington, Washington can thrive. He also serves as the chair of the May 1st Action Coalition, um, which is responsible for the May Day March in support of civil labor and human rights. Um, Juan Jose was born in Reynosa, and I'm probably going to butcher this, I apologize, um, Tamalapas? You'll have to say it when you come up here. <laughs> uh, Mexico, and he grew up in Corpus Christi, Texas. He moved to Seattle to get a graduate degree in social work at the UW, and has been an activist ever since, leading efforts to diversify the University of Washington School of Social Work and create its multi-ethnic practice program. And he was also active in the group that occupied, occupied Beacon Hill High School, and um, or sorry, Beacon Hill School, and helped turn it into what we know now as El Centro de la Raza. Um, Carlos Marentes is the director and founding member, founding member of El Comité. Um, it's a small grassroots organization focused on civil labor and human rights, and his influence extends beyond locally to internationally with his involvement with a major farmers group, uh, which led to the development of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Carlos is also a PhD candidate in the economics doctoral program at the University of Massachusetts, where he also previously served as the director of organizing for the graduate employees union. He has led teach-ins, workshops on economics and racial justice, and has taught econometrics, political economy of social movements and the political economy of food. So you can see we are joined by some experts. If I got anything wrong please, about your history, please uh, correct it once you get up here. But we are really joined by some amazing folks who have really done this work in the community and at the state level and can invite you up and, and learn from you. Thank you. All right, it's technically before noon, so good morning, everyone. All right. Um, first of all, thank you so much to Christina for reaching out to us at the Budget and Policy Center and, and having us come and, and give this presentation today. Um, as she said, I am Andy Nicholas. I'm the uh, senior fellow at the Washington State Budget and Policy Center. If you're not familiar with the Budget and Policy Center, we are a nonpartisan, nonprofit research and advocacy organization that focuses on building a just and prosperous future for all Washingtonians. Um, and by that, we mean the Washingtonians who need a just and prosperous future, not those at the very top, but those who have been left behind um, in our decades, many decades of strong uh, economic growth, and as we'll see today, strong growth in, um, and not so, not so good, strong growth in inequality. Um, so what I am going to cover today in just uh, 20, 30 minutes or so um, is a general, talking about the general rise in inequality in our state. Um, most of this is, is built around Washington State. We're a statewide organization. Um, but when we get into q and I'm happy to um, talk to, and, and I'm sure you all know what's going on with these statistics in King County much better than I do. But I, do, I did pull some um, just ahead of this talk. So I'm going to talk about rise in inequality, income and wealth inequality generally. And then I'm going to spend most of my, my presentation talking about the racial justice implications for that rise in inequality, and particularly how our tax code exacerbates uh, wealth, and e wealth and income inequality in our state. But the good news is, is that I will offer some solutions that we as an organization have been promoting for a number of years now that we think are good, bold first steps towards building a better, more prosperous, healthy state for everyone in our state. Um, and so before I get into that, I do think it's important to point out that, um, yes, I am indeed a cisgendered white male. And sometimes people ask, well, why are you up here lecturing us about racial justice? And the reality is, is I actually can't imagine a more unjust set of circumstances than to place the responsibility for educating people about the reality of racism in communities on the people of color who are experiencing that very racism. So I very much view myself as having a strong responsibility as a white person to understand what's going on in communities that are not my own and to help educate other people about what's going on and why we all need to work together to build a better future. Um, 
Thank you. <laughs> um, um, so there's three fundamental points that I hope you'll take away from my presentation today. First, we have an undeniable legacy of racial oppression and bigotry that um, we are part of the United States. There's a, obviously a lengthy history there, but we have our own unique and bad history when it comes to racial justice in Washington State. And I'll walk through some pretty bad examples of what we have done through public policy to people of color in our state. Second, our state and local tax codes are one of the major barriers to equality that we have erected and perpetuated over many generations in our state. But the good news, and my third and final key point, is that it doesn't have to be this way. Um, yes, the messaging experts always say you have to be aspirational and give people uh, a reason to come on board. And, th and that's good advice, and it's also true. Um, despite the craziness of what's going on at the national level, we here in Washington State can actually make good choices and change our laws to build better, a better future, stronger communities across the board. Um, but let's pull back and just look at the, uh, what's going on broadly with um, wealth and income inequality in Washington state in general. So here we see this is growth in inflation adjusted incomes uh, since 1979 for the top 1% of Washingtonians versus the everybody else, the bottom 99%. And it's pretty disturbing. The top 1% have seen their incomes, even accounting for inflation, grow by 142% since 1979, while the bottom 99% on average have seen their incomes actually decline slightly once you take inflation into account. This is simply statewide data. As we all know here in King County, um, in some ways this is an actual, an actually a, a worse dynamic. Um, we've seen that the, uh, the ratio of top to bottom is, is higher in King County than it is um, in other parts of the state. Um, and in fact, if you look at King County relative to all the other counties across the state, or excuse me, across the nation, um, we rank 95th in the nation for, the mo for inequality. That doesn't sound too bad, 95, okay. That's out of 3,606 counties in the nation. So 95th out of that for worst inequality. Um, so we have some, you know, and, and you guys are, you guys do this day to day, you see this reality on the ground. So this is the picture of inequality in general. Um, but let's, again, let's dive into the racial justice implications of that, which is really kind of the meat of of well, why we're here today. And my first key point is you may recall that we have this undeniable and lengthy history of oppression and bigotry in our state that continues to play, um, have extremely negative consequences for people and communities across our state. So what I'm gonna do now is go through some of what I would say the low lights in terms of uh, our history in Washington State. And you know, these, these are setting the stage for the conditions that we see um, across the state today. So let's go back to before Washington was even a state. So this is in the mid 19th century when we were a territory. I mean, you know, we, and again, we think of ourselves as progressive, you know, forward thinking Washington state. But the people who formed Washington state, the territorial government passed a resolution endorsing slavery. That's just true. That's the people who set our state up, passed a resolution saying the Dred Scott decision, which is the US Supreme Court decision that said that slaves have to be returned, that they are property, that they are not the, given the same rights as essentially at the time wealthy white men. Um, and that is something that the territorial government, the, our founding fathers said, that's great. So that's, that's who we started off as, as a state. That same territorial government, not too long later, uh, went on and passed a slew of anti-Asian taxes. In fact, they passed a poll tax, which sounds like something that is on voting. It's not. It's a per head of household tax. They passed a tax on specifically targeting Chinese immigrants that was three times higher than the same tax applied to white households. And if you look at the statute, it was basic. I, I don't have it in front of me, but it was basically the keep Chinese immigrants out of Washington state tax. I mean, that is, it was that bold face. Like, that's what they were trying to do. Um, 
Of course, we haven't been very kind, to put it mildly, to um, indigenous and Native American people living in Washington state. Uh, we have a whole awful history associated with that that actually is still continues to be very recently. Just in the last couple of years, um, our, uh, the US Supreme Court struck down a policies and laws that our state government had been perpetuating, which were denying fishing rights to tribal people and hunting rights to tribal people living living in Washington state, things that were guaranteed to them in uh, treaties, and yet our state government continued to deny uh, indigenous people and Native Americans in our state access to this historical and important source of wealth and opportunity for those communities. And then the final historical low light that I'll bring up right now is that in Washington state during World War II, um, of course, we um, uh, participated in the disastrous uh, internment camps for Japanese American citizens, but we also, we had a big shortage of labor because uh, young men in Washington state were going off to fight the war. We, um, we participated in a national program to bring Mexican quote unquote guest workers into Washington state in order to fill the gaps. Well, guess what? They were promised good wages and, and good working conditions and clean living conditions. The reality is that their wages were stolen. Their working conditions were horrendous and inhumane Maine, and their living conditions were gross and completely unhealthy. And we as a state actively participated in this program. Um, and actually, I just want to thank Juan Boca for actually pointing this out to us when we were doing our research on this. Um, so this is the stage that we have set for today. A lot of times people hear this stuff, and, and I know you guys are um, a really smart and astute crowd, but sometimes people be like, well, this is all well and good, but this is history. Like, what does this have to do with today? And the reality is, is it has everything to do with today. The conditions that we see across community, uh, uh, um, in communities across our state have everything to do with these barriers, with these policies that we have erected in the past and perpetuated that specifically deny people of color access to opportunity to the benefit of white people in our state. And so let's look at what this reality is today. And, and I should say, the list that I, that I just presented here is in no way exhaustive. This is in no way complete. This is just a few list of lowlights. And one of the things that you encounter when you do research like this is you don't want to erase anybody's history. Um, and so um, when we give a talks like this and we give events, we very, very much want to hear what has, tell me about the nuances in your community and things that we can add to our own knowledge as an organization. So um, please don't think that this is just somehow the comprehensive list. But what does this mean today? What does this history mean today? Well, we still face rampant housing discrimination across our state and across our country. Many of you may be aware of a 2018 study that came out that found that in 40% of cases, people looking for rental housing, if they were black, were given completely unequitable treatment relative to white people who were looking for rental housing. So we continue to perpetuate policies that deny access to just housing, a place to live to people of color across our state. We still see rampant employment discrimination across the country. Uh, in fact, studies have shown that simply having a quote unquote white sounding name means that you are 50% in this country, 50% more likely to be called back for a job interview than if you have a quote unquote black sounding name in this country. Um, and in fact, when economists go in, and Carolyn probably knows a thing or two about this, when economists go in and actually try to uh, put a value on this, they find the economic value of just having a white sounding name is equivalent to eight additional years of work experience relative to someone who has a quote unquote black sounding name. So the reality today is that we have policies and a history that has made it hard for people to get housing, basic needs. We made it hard for them to get good jobs and to build wealth for their families. And how do you see that play out? You see it play out in a gigantic and growing racial wealth gap. And so um, if wealth in this country were distributed equally. White people in America are about 65% of the population. People of color are about 35% of the population. You would think if we lived in, at least under some definition of equity, that that would mean white people would have about 65% of the wealth. People of color would have about 35% of the wealth. Um, as we're about to see, that is nowhere near the case. In fact, most of the wealth is held by the wealthiest 10% of white people. 
fact, here we see the wealthiest 10% of white people alone have 65% of the total wealth in our country. And people of color, who remember are 35% of the population, have only 13% of the total wealth in the country. So this is the impact of that history. Right? This is what that means on the ground today. In fact, let's look at it a different way. Let's look at the typical, uh, the typical household by race, ethnicity, the total amount of wealth they have, or the median family um, uh, by race, ethnicity. What was your data source? Uh, Where did you get your data source? Um, the um, uh, Board of Federal, the, the Fed Reserve, they have a cons um, the Consumer Finances Survey, this is 2016. It's really problematic data, <laughs> as you may, may well know. Um, but it's literally the best that we have out there when it comes to, to wealth. Um, <clears throat> so here we see the typical white household in this country, the median white household, has 10 times the amount of wealth as the typical black household and eight times the amount of wealth as the typical Latino or Hispanic household. So again, this is the impact of that history, this glaring racial wealth gap that we have perpetuated and erected through a history of problematic, to say the least, um, public policies. My second key point, remember my first key point was that um, um, we have an undeniable history of racism and oppression. My second key point is that our tax code is one of those barriers that we continue to erect. There is a whole lot that is wrong with Washington State's tax code that many of you may be aware of. Um, and I'm gonna go through sort of three, again, kind of low lights, problems with the state tax code that we have in Washington. First is that it fails at its most basic function, which is to generate resources to fund public services across the state. That is why you have taxes to begin with, to be able to invest in your communities. We have a tax code that fails at that basic function, and I'll talk about that in, in a little bit more detail in a moment. Second, we have a, the, a part of an explanation for that, but something that also has its own disastrous racial justice implications, is that we've enacted through our constitution and through statute some harmful property tax limits that serve to starve communities and, as, as we will see, have pretty dire racial justice implications. And then finally, and many of you are aware of this, we have a deeply regressive tax code, and that takes a very disproportionate toll on people of color across our state. But to my first point, um, let's look at total state tax revenue. This isn't local, this is just the state bit, um, but I think it's essentially a similar trend if you put it together. We're gonna look at um, state taxes relative to the overall state economy going back to the mid-1990s. So here we see back in 1995, total state taxes amounted to about 7% of the total state economy. Fast forward to today, it's at 5% and falling. That doesn't sound like much, like two percentage points, like 7%, 5%, but that's a 30% decline in the ability of the tax code to maintain existing commitments to stuff over just a 20 year period. And a couple of things to note about this graph. Like one, you see this big dip during the recession and that might seem intuitive, like yeah, everything goes bad during recessions. But what that actually means is tax revenues were falling faster than the economy at large. Like that shouldn't be the case. And then you see a substantially no recovery following the recession. We're just mired at these recession levels of revenue. And what's remarkable about this period is the, the legislature has actually enacted some tax increases. There was a big property tax boost for schools across our state a few years ago. The legislature actually just did by, um, by at least their standards, you wanna set the bar low, did some pretty bold tax reform stuff uh, this last year, and yet it substantially does nothing um, to keep the tax code um, you know, to grow relative to the economy. And what that tells you, what the fact is that you continue to raise taxes and you don't make any progress against the economy, is that the underlying base, the stuff that we are taxing, is deeply flawed. That we're not taxing things that keep pace with just the growth in our economy, and that's a pretty darn good proxy for what you need just to maintain what your, your existing commitments in public services, let alone what we need to do. I mean, 
Back in 1995, Washington State was not exactly a utopia, as some of you who, are, who may have been around back then might remember. Um, and so we should be at, I mean, 7% should be the minimum of what we're investing. We should be looking uh, much more bold than that, given the needs for communities across our state. So the tax code fails at this like basic primary function to fund public services. And again, a major explanation for that are these ridiculous property tax restraints we have. In the Constitution, regular levies can be taxed at a maximum of 1%. And then, of course, Mr. Iman came along in the early 2000s and passed a deceptive initiative that capped growth in revenues to 1% per year. And the combination of those things kind of explains that graph back there, that uh, we continue to keep revenues low. I'll, I'll, let me finish my spiel on this, and then I'll, I'll let you... Uh, uh, comment on it. We continue to keep revenues low through these uh, property tax limitations. But if you think about who that benefits, well, guess what? White people in Washington state are much, much more likely to own their own homes and to own investment properties than are people of color in Washington state. So we suppress property tax revenues in a way that keeps revenues low that could be invested in ways that would help all communities move forward and it just so happens um, that that has uh, outsized benefits for white people across our state. If the legislature enough penalties, the courts threw out the kind of initiative. The legislature put it back. In I know. So, yes. I mean, it wasn't, you know, the, yeah, great. We, have, we always get these bad initiatives, and they're almost always found to be illegal. But the legislature tripped over themselves to stick that limit back in place, and they could change it any time. That's absolutely true. And in fact, one of the things we hammered uh, on when they did the so-called McCleary fix a couple of years ago, like, yes, they added a new state levy, but they didn't take away the 1% levy growth limit. And it's only going to be a decade or so when we, when we looked at it at the time before we're right back down to uh, funding levels that we were at that got us into the K-12 through funding mess in the first place. So um, absolutely right. Not, not at all trying to let the legislature off the hook on anything on this. I mean, again, the whole thing is we, we can change change laws. The legislature changes laws. We can change all of these laws to build a better future, and they're the body that is responsible for doing that. Um, and then the final um, sort of facet of our tax code that is uh, especially problematic for racial justice is the fact that it is deeply regressive. And many of you have probably seen this. We have an extraordinarily re uh, regressive tax code. Some of you may have seen variations on this graph where if you're in the poorest fifth of households, you pay nearly 20% of your annual income in state and local taxes. If you're in the top 3%, you pay 3% or less. The distance between those two is wider in Washington state than in any other state in the country, meaning we have the most regressive or most upside down state and local tax code in the country. But let's dig a little bit deeper. These are just averages within income buckets. Let's look at who are in these different income buckets. And so what we're going to see in this next graph are we're going to compare the richest fifth of the population and the poorest fifth of the population. And we're going to do that by race ethnicity in our state. So if you're a white Washingtonian, you have about a 20% chance of being in the poorest fifth of the population. And if you're a white Washingtonian, you have about the same chance, a little bit higher actually, of being in the richest fifth of the population. To me, the takeaway here is that you have the American dream if you're a white person. You can sink or swim by your own merits. Your odds of being in either end of the income scale are roughly the same. But that is not true if you are a member or a person of color in Washington state. If you are a black or African-American Washingtonian, your odds of being in the poorest fifth of households are over 30% and your odds of being in the richest fifth are around 10%. Whoa, major difference in opportunity uh, there. And again, this just goes back to the history that we had. We have created this landscape through public policies that we continue to perpetuate. The exact dy same dynamic is true for Native American Washingtonians, well over 30%, 35% chance of being in the poorest fifth. Again, 10% chance of being in the richest fifth. Same thing is true for Hispanic or Latino, a quarter chance, 26% chance of being in the richest fifth, less than 10% chance of being in, or excuse me, uh, 
a less than 10% chance of being in the richest fifth. So again, this is how you see very vividly how this history plays out um, in terms of who has opportunities to move forward in our state and who is being held back. One of the problems um, in doing this in general is the, we, we probably all know race is not a real thing. It's a human construct, right? And so, um, um, the data can be really bad, and lumping all Asian people together is especially problematic. Um, the, the differences across communities are really stark. People in the Hmong community, for example, have much different experiences than do Japanese Americans or Chinese Americans, and yet the sources that we have don't allow us to tell that kind of granular story. So the bucket of Asian in general shows um, about the same dynamic as with white people, but we know that that's much different. And so we as an organization, wherever we can, try to disaggregate as much as possible. Um, but um, in the interest of time and for this presentation, I decided to focus on these groups. So it doesn't have to be this way. This is where we get to the good news, the aspirational, we can change things. Now those of you um, who follow the Budget and Policy Center, you may know that we are strong proponents of a statewide capital gains tax. Um, and the reason for that is that the reason we have this like very low effective tax rate for people at the very top of the income scale is that we don't do much to tax entrenched income or wealth. And capital gains are the most concentrated form of wealth that is out there. Um, and in fact, let's just for a moment look at the share of the population in Washington state that would actually be subject to a state capital gains tax, which is almost exclusively people with incomes greater than a million dollars. So that share of the population, the, the millionaires with a minimum of one million, amount to 0.35% of the population in Washington state. Want to know how much capital gains they have in terms of the total amount of capital gains in our state? 60%, pretty much. 0.35% of the population has 60% of all capital gains wealth in Washington state. And it, that is wealth that is virtually untaxed in our state and local tax code. So that is a major reason why we think it's a good idea to extend our tax code to include untaxed capital gains. It would bring a little bit of balance, raise that effective tax rate at the very top a tiny little bit, not much. Most of the proposals that have gone through the legislature so far, which would tax capital gains at the same rate or less than what Oregon does, would raise the effective tax rate at the top from 3% to maybe 4%. Not too much to ask, but it would generate billions of additional dollars for uh, people and communities across the state every year. Um, and of course, there are major racial justice implications uh, associated with our lack of a state capital gains tax. We saw that white people, the typical white household has 10 times the amount of wealth in general as uh, the typical black or Latinx household. If you look at just financial wealth, corporate stocks and bonds, the stuff a capital gains tax would apply to, the typical white household has more than 17 times the amount of financial wealth as the typical Latinx household, and more than 13 times the amount, the amount of uh, uh, financial wealth as the typical black household. So this is a, a form of wealth that is heavily concentrated at the top and heavily concentrated among a small group and a very white portion of the population. So the first major bucket in, in the report, and I in, include you all to go to our website and check out the report that I'm doing this on, um, is that we need, need to um, ask the, the wealthy to, fa to pay their fair share. And we think a state capital gains tax is a great first step in that direction. The second thing we need to do is to reduce taxes for people at the bottom of the income scale. Um, and in the interest of time, I want to make sure we give Boca and Carlos plenty of time. Our major um, proposal for doing that is funding a state version of the earned income tax credit called the Working Families Tax Credit. Um, this is a program we've had on the books since 2008 in Washington State, and yet we can't get the legislature to put the funding into your point about courageousness among lawmakers. We can't get the legislature to put the funding forward to get that program up and running. That is the most efficient, most effective, most impactful way to reduce taxes at the very, uh, for those who are facing the 17% um, bracket 
or, or in, um, tax level at the top. And then the final thing we need to do is make sure we have just rules. The major thing in this bucket that we, we like to talk about is so-called supermajority laws, in which a law that says you can only pass a tax change, a tax increase, if you get two-thirds of the legislature to go along with it. You may know that the state Supreme Court struck that down recently, and that was great. Um, but the problem is, is I am perennially hearing lawmakers touting some absurd notion of a grand bargain where maybe you get some kind of progressive reform and then a constitutional amendment that gives a supermajority law uh, that enshrines it into the Constitution. That is a terrible and unnecessary deal. The, what that does, what a supermajority law does, is put power in the hands of a small group, um, just a few senators in our state legislature, who are just fine with the levels of inequality that we have, whose major goals are to keep taxes low for the rich and powerful. We do not need to give that group a disproportional amount of power. We need to make sure that power um, um, is shared as justly as possible, and that is um, exactly the opposite of what a supermajority law does. So we need to keep those permanently off the books. And then the final thing in this bucket is we need to have a better, we need to have better reserves. So the next time we enter a recession, we need to have a strong state rainy day fund. And it's not bad where it is, but it's not enough because the people who will be impacted by a recession are people of color, low and moderate income people who are most likely to lose a job, lose their health coverage, and those backstops that we provide through public services are more important then than ever. And I'm very concerned that you know any hour now we're going to hit a recession um, that we're not prepared for it. Um, so anyway, back to my three key points just to wrap up. We have an undeniable legacy of oppression and discrimination in Washington state that continues to play out and harm communities across our state today. Our tax code is one of the major barriers that we continue to perpetuate um, and we need to fix it. And the good news is there are some great ways to do that. We think in particular a statewide capital gains tax and funding the working families tax credit are the best and initial first steps to getting there and we think we can get them done in the next couple of years. Thank you so much, and I want to make sure um, Juan and Carlos get time, and then maybe we could do Q&A for all of us at the end. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You know, it's, it's nice to have uh, white folks talk about the shit we've gone through, right? Um, and it makes it a much stronger case for everybody to participate in. Um, so far, uh, we've seen a lack of commitment on the part of our legislature to really change things around. And I think it talks much about the history of the state and talks about the history of our country in general. Um, I'm sorry, my name is Juan Jose Bocanegra, <laughs> and I'm the director of All In For Washington, which is a coalition. I mean, it's not like we have a great, great uh, staff. There's only two of us in the staff. But that's not the strength. The strength is in our partners. The strength is in the communities that work with us. Uh, we have uh, organizations such as El Comité, ACRS, One America, um, Poverty Action Center, and a number of other organizations that participate with us and are helping us spread the word. Because one of the things that, um, you know, we don't talk much about is the educational part that is needed in our communities for people to participate. And so our major, our major effort of All In For Washington is to focus on communities of color and immigrant communities and native communities to have them participate in this, this awful situation that we find ourselves in. And so it's really important for us to you know, start talking to our communities um, because one of the things that always happens to our communities is that we're asked, we're pushed to participate in democracy. And as always, we always participate. 20% of all casualties in Vietnam uh, were Latinos. 
So it's not like we haven't really shown our commitment to participate in democracy. <clears throat> but yet, the end result of that participation in the process of democracy and obtaining wealth and trying to uh, make life better for everybody always comes out skewed for people of color. They're the last ones to get the process. And so, you know, it's not so much that there's a, uh, an evil plot by a bunch of white folks to try and um, exploit the hell out of people of color. I mean, that is kind of the result, but it's the result of a system that we've created, a system that has actually run its course. It is dying. It is in its last leg. And we have to be more creative. We have to be much more aggressive. And I love the, young, the youth of today, because they are aggressive. They are beginning to understand the dynamics of this so-called democracy that we presently have. And so there's a lot more involvement, a lot more participation. And we know that the only way we're going to eliminate racism in this country, or at least give it a good kick in the butt, and the only way we're going to eliminate sexism in this country, and the only way we're going to eliminate what is going to be one of the biggest civil rights movements in this country, and that's income inequality, is for us to fight for socialism. There is no other way. Our fight is not so much for you know, tweaking the 3%, the 1%, the but to try and level this once and for all, or at least give it a good effort in the, into, the, into the future. And so, you know, many of us say, well, you know, that's, that's big. That's a big problem. You start seeing numbers like this. I took, I recently came from Yakima. I was in Yakima for a couple of days uh, trying to organize a meeting down there. And it was, you know, it, I hadn't been in Yakima for around 17 years. I've done a lot of organizing down there. I helped pass the first Simpson Rodino bill, which is the immigration uh, bill that legalized well, well over a million people. And so I'm pretty knowledgeable about the Yakima Valley, but things have changed radically in Yakima. There's much more antagonism. There's much more racial conflict. There's much more uh, desperation by the youth. There's a high level rate of uh, suicides in the valley and in rural areas throughout this country and throughout Washington State. And Washington State has a high level of unemployment, which I, you know, it was hard for me to, to really understand that. I mean, Washington State unemployment for Latinos was 7.6%. I can imagine around African Americans was probably even higher and Native Americans through the roof. And this is during a period of time when the average unemployment rate is at 4.3% 4, 4 or something like that. And so there is already, you know, this skewed situation going around, around employment. And even in states like Idaho and Oregon and Montana, those numbers are a lot lower. In Washington State, it's a lot higher than any other place. So, I mean, you can sum it up whatever, however you want to. You can look at it from whatever angle you want to. But there is still a lot of issues that we have to deal with, with a 20% Unemployment uh, dropout rate for Latinos uh, nationally, uh, you know, is the same for a lot of other communities. So, you know, we have a lot of stuff to arrest. We have a lot of things to stop because, you know, we have we have a responsibility, a dire responsibility to our future generations, and we have that in our hands right now. And the only, the biggest cause of that destruction, of that environmental destruction, is capital. It's not that the world somehow is twist, tilted in its axis, or it's kind of spun out of control. No, the other thing that's spun out of control is this economic system that we have so far, that whose only purpose is profit versus the needs of the people of the world. And so we, you know, we definitely have to put a control on this. We have to put, like the horses, we have to put a bit on it and tighten it up and pull it back. It's not that, it's not that we hate capital. I mean, I know a lot of us envy people that are rich. You know, we would want to be rich, right? 
but at the cost of whom? Of the thousands of people that are in the streets right now? At the cost of women that are being pushed into poverty at highest levels in the history of this country? At the poverty levels that are being faced by numerous uh, communities uh, right now? And with the potential of what um, Andy talked about, and that is a, an economic disaster. Because all that is in, in the horizon. You know? It's not something that I'm making up or something that already exists and it's already being pointed out by a lot of folks. And our recent victory in the city of Seattle points to the fact that there are changes and that there are people in this country and in this city who are willing and able to accept that these changes are coming and that we need to participate, each and every one of us. Because one of the things that is happening so far with legislature, with the legislators, is that they really don't, um, they're afraid in many ways. They don't have the support of people in the community. And it's our jobs to make sure that they know that we are supporting progressive legislation. Legislation that is willing to take the bull by the horns. Legislation that is really willing to make mechanical changes that are structural, that will focus on reducing or eliminating all the inequalities that we face in our state of Washington right now. And it's not, you know, this is not magical, this is not, this is not rocket science, folks. It's very simple. There are people who are making enormous amounts of money through a system that we created that we need to control. And we have that capacity. We have the capacity in the county, we have the capacity in the city, we have the capacity in the state. Now, Andy pointed out to some of the big problems that we face in the state legislature and the state constitution that are written in, like the issue of taxes, property, those kinds of things that need to be changed. Those are constitutional issues that we have to get out there and remove them because they are real serious impediments to the development of the state of Washington and have been. One of the reasons they can get away with us not pushing rent control is because they have that piece of, of legislation that, that supports property owners over the rest of the population. We have not been able to reduce the amount of impact that the federal government has on our immigrant populations. And we have thousands of people in this state that are not represented, but are being taxed and will never see their monies coming back to them. I've run into a lot of farm workers that have since been injured on the job, cannot return back to their country of origin, and are now facing poverty without health care and, and without social security. And these are people that have given their lives so that you and myself and everybody else can eat vegetables, can eat fruits, and can survive in an environment that it makes the food cheap. But they have paid the maximum sacrifice. They have their bodies are no good anymore, and nobody is willing to take care of them. So we have to be creative. We have to be much more aggressive on how we see the problems and how we begin to, to offer the remedies. The ga capital gains tax is good. We need to do that twice. We need to get out there and really put that as a big, major issue for us to win, family tax credit. But let's not stop there, folks. That's just the starting point. This, we can do it in the Washington State. Washington State and the Seattle area and the King County area. I mean, Washington State was known as the cradle of the red diaper baby. Yeah. And it was the, the area where the first general strike happened in this country. And it is the, the state where we have seen a lot of progressive initiatives come out. And we, I know we can do it. I know we are capable of it. I've been experimenting with this work since I got to the state of Washington in 1971, and I've seen major changes, major changes. 
but the structural changes keep us from moving forward. And we've seen a lot of more racial um, equity. We've seen offices of equity develop, which is you know something that when I got here, I didn't even know what the hell that was, right? But you know there are folks in our communities now that are producing and are developing much more elaborate programs than we've had. And that's one of the reasons I've asked Carlos to join me and, uh, and explain to you some of those programs that we have initiated in the community, especially in educating people that are undocumented and how they can participate in this movement toward equity. Carlos, por favor. Uh, good afternoon, buenas tardes. My name is uh, Carlos Marentes. Um, and what I'd like to do is kind of just talk a little bit about some of the work that we do in the organization that is linked to a lot of the stuff that, you know, Andy and Boca has alluded to, uh, both in terms of this issue of the tax structure, but I think more importantly, uh, in speaking under this very broad theme or this very broad agenda of equity and social justice, uh, something that we identify that is very much a key element of being able to fulfill these you know, objectives of equity and social justice, which is racial economic justice itself. So let me start off by saying that uh, my participation in terms of the work uh, has also been a lifelong participation growing up uh, within the farm worker movement, both in California and in Texas. I uh, was able to kind of see a lot of these issues that you know, are affect uh, particularly our Latino community. And in many cases, those that, at least on this side of the mountain, we kind of tend to forget, right? Because you know the type of communities that are impacted most greatly by these inequalities and injustices are usually you know, a little bit on the east side of the mountain more so than, than in the I-5 corridor. Although we do have populations of that uh, that suffer those same you know, injustices. One of the things that we do in El Comité is to more than anything not focus on one particular issue. Um, we are very much aware that all the different issues that our communities face, in particular the immigrant and immigrant Latino community, are pretty much covering a wide spectrum of issues, whether it's economic, uh, issues of uh, representation, um, health and education, all of those are kind of mixed in to give us what you know we see as a huge package of marginalization and inequality for many of uh, members of our community. In terms of the work that we have been doing, uh, the main purpose of it has been developing not only leadership, but also the capacity building for our own communities to be able to speak for themselves on these particular issues. Uh, I'd like to kind of just take a brief second to really appreciate the words that Andy said earlier about, you know, taking that responsibility about talking about these issues uh, when perhaps, you know, we might think that a person of color is best to do it. And I think we kind of need to challenge that a little bit to say that it's not just one group or the other's responsibility, it's all of our responsibility. And part of that responsibility is ensuring that the people that have been voiceless for so many have the capacity to be able to speak on these issues, and more importantly, have the opportunities such as these forums uh, to be able to present to you directly their lived experiences, even if they might not come in the form of a PowerPoint or a data itself. One of the focuses that we're engaged in right now is this question around public charge. Um, many of you are probably familiar with it, is this new proposal that at the moment is still uh, under review by the courts. Uh, there has been some challenges, but nonetheless, the effects of policies such as these, which seek to determine eligibility for uh, permanent residency here in the United States has already caused a tremendous amount of damage in our community. 
Uh, part of that has been uh, lack of participation in school lunch programs on behalf of families because of the fear of how participation might impact their possibilities in the future to adjust their status. Also, the possibility of information being leaked out to where, you know, potential detention or raids by ICE might occur because of the information that needs to be provided for some of these programs. Uh, additional situations that we're facing are that, you know, there is a lot of hesitancy for individuals to seek out some of the services provided both at the local and at the state level, including the federal level, because of fear of both the information usage and also whether it's gonna be held against them uh, at a future date if they decide to uh, adjust their immigration status. Let me give you a little story of something that we recently uh, became aware of uh, in the northern part of King County where we have been doing some of these presentations. Uh, we've recently become aware that there are families living in public housing that are leaving their children, their citizen born children in their homes while they go and live somewhere else because of the fear that their status might bring attention or might you know, lead to some consequences involving ICE uh, later down the road. And that's not the worst of the problem. The other one is having to do with the behavior or at least the mental health situation of our children because of situations such as, you know, the fear brought about these types of policies such as public charge. Now you might say, well, wait a minute, Carlos, I thought, you know, we were gonna talk about the tax structure and, you know, this inequality that exists uh, both within different communities. Uh, but this is part of those individual points that are kind of intertwined with this whole aspect of not only the regressive tax system itself, but also the regressive nature, as Boca had mentioned, of representation in, in our state and in our country. One of the things that I, you know, I'd like to kind of just emphasize is that in terms of you know, fixing the regressive nature of the tax structure uh, is very important, but along with that also has to be the participation of disenfranchised community people that do not have the ability to pressure those legislators to do the right thing. Uh, some of the statistics point that in the last elections here in our state, uh, somewhere around 24% of the Latino community came out to vote and said, well, that's pretty low. Well, it's pretty low because a large part of them, close to 60%, can't vote. Either can't vote or do not have the right to vote because there doesn't exist policy that would allow individuals that contribute into the tax system to be able to also exercise uh, their right to decide what is the best way to spend those monies or what you know, programs need funding. The other aspect of it that kind of intertwines with all these issues that are facing immigrant communities also involve this question of wealth inequality. Uh, Andy kind of mentioned some national statistics, but even if you just look at the in terms of housing, uh, many of you already know that housing is a very particularly big issue for people of color. You know, I'm not gonna go into the statistics, you know, in terms of the homeless rates, but you know that amongst the, the largest share of homeless people are people of color. Uh, for Latinos, it's around 15%. And you kind of have to ask yourself, well, where is, you know, where are the support services? Where are all these, you know, things that are necessary to ensure that, you know, those numbers don't exist? Well, before you look at the policy, let me, let me take us back a little bit and look at other aspects of economic characteristics of our community that might kind of shed a light as to why we're more susceptible to falling into that situation of homelessness. In King County, uh, less than 34% of Latinos uh, own a home. That means that you know, when you think about it uh, and you make some additional calculations, and let me make a caveat, um, 
if you're good at statistics as numbers, you can say a lot with numbers, and then it's not always true, and it might also not shed a clear light of what those ranges mean, right? Uh, just because you know the average or the median income is around seventy thousand dollars, it doesn't tell you anything of er the forty-nine percent below that. It just tells you who the middle person is. But even still. Uh, you know, making some rough calculations in terms of the impact of housing and the disproportionality of being able to own homes, that kind of gives us a clear idea that in terms of the Latino community, you know, any approach that has to deal with issues of taxing property uh, automatically leaves a big chunk of that community out. And so the regressive nature of the taxation continues to exist. In other words, communities that are not able to participate in some of these programs that would alleviate the regressive nature of the tax continue to be the subsidizers of the programs that are needed to support them so that others can continue the type of life and wealth generation that they're able to do because of that situation. Now, this is not just a situation where, you know, it's uh, problems of whether, you know, you're able to own a home or anything. I mean, these have much more deeper implications and are uh, multi-generational implications. Um, one of the issues uh, with wealth inequality is uh, educational outcomes on children, all right? Uh, recent, uh, and I shouldn't say recent because this is one of the major topics that is often researched in economics, is the impacts of uh, wealth inequality. Um, and one of the things that's been found is that there is substantial evidence to point that wealth inequalities has a direct impact on educational outcomes. Um, just to give you a, a, a piece of data, um, if your family makes more than $225,000, according to the Urban Institute, then you know, more than likely, uh, you got 1.2% more uh, times more likely, sorry, 1.2 times more likely to actually finish a two-year college degree versus if you make less than 20,000. Now, for some folks, that might not mean a lot, but in terms of wages, that's a huge difference. That's almost a 30% difference between going to work right out of house, uh, high school versus having an even just an AA degree, right? And so these are things that kind of perpetuate this whole racial inequality, this whole issue of e social and economic injustice that, you know, alone by just looking at one particular area or focus uh, will not be sufficient. And so that's why we've kind of, at least with the Comité and in the work that we've been doing with All In for Washington, we've kind of been pushing to expand that vision a little bit broader. Yes, we do need tax reform, but fundamentally what we need is economic justice in order to ensure that equity and social justice uh, becomes a reality. Um, I'm going to stop there just for the sake of time. And, you know, if there's any questions, we can address some of those issues as well. Thank you.